My great-grandfather, uh, Jackie Ho, he was a very forceful individual, and they looked up to him. And uh, he was elected as such the High Constable of the Borough of Girardeau, and then eventually the County Delegate of the Ancient of Fibernians. Not everyone who worked in the mines and gathered in the saloons thought fraternal clubs and labor unions could punch their ticket to security. There was a small group of men who had other ideas about how to handle workplace grievances. Most of these men came from the remote western corner of Ireland. They were often Gaelic speaking and as such isolated even from other Irish in America. These fellows were very, very tough characters. A lot of them came from Donegal, which is a, a wild part of Ireland, stony, rocky, and their characters were very much a part of that landscape. They were hard men used to a hard life. They didn't expect to get justice for themselves in any way but by force. Even taken as a group, these men were an impulse. They were without forethought or organization. They simply lashed out at the person they could get to. If you were a coal miner or a laborer, your anger was directed at those who were most directly in authority over you. And in this case, that would be someone like a ticket boss or mine boss. Because they could directly tie his role in their lives to how much money they had in their pocket because what he said would determine how much money they got at the end of the work week. That ticket boss would say, well, this isn't a full car of coal. There's stone in there, or there's slate in there, or there's sticks in there. So you're not going to be able to get full credit for this. You'll only get 50% or 60% or 70% for it. So they would be docked so much for that coal car. And it was an ongoing problem. It was a constant complaint. Complaint occasionally escalated to threat, and threat to assault. On a hot summer evening in 1862, a ticket boss was beaten to death by a gang of mine laborers. At the time, nobody made much of the murder, and over the next decade, there were only a handful of other crimes against mine bosses. Then in 1875, after a six-month strike, the owners crushed the union and made the men beg for their jobs back at lower wages. An uneasy peace fell apart. Six people were murdered, three of the mine bosses. By then, Philadelphia and Reading President Franklin Gowan had funded his own police force and hired the renowned Pinkerton Agency. Undercover detectives emerged with tales of murder and destruction of property, all committed by this gang of Donegalers they dubbed the Molly Maguires after one of Ireland's notoriously violent secret societies. The ringleaders, according to detectives, were two Irish Catholic tavern owners who had long supported the laborers and their families against the mine owners, Jack Keogh and Alec Campbell. The Catholic Church was horrified and issued an order of excommunication for anyone involved with the Mollies. A disgrace to us as Irishmen and American citizens, said one local priest. A conspiracy against the souls of men, said Father Daniel McDermott, against our country, against religion, against Christ. The coal and iron police began to round up dozens of suspected Molly Maguires and an armed vigilante group stormed a house at Wagain's Patch, murdering one alleged Molly and gunning down his pregnant sister. Both Jack Keogh and Alec Campbell were dragged off to jail in the middle of the night. The coal companies donated the services of their own attorneys to prosecute the Mollies. Franklin Gowan himself took the lead. Franklin Gowan, because of his gift at oratory, was able to very, very successfully and very convincingly for a 19th century audience receptive to the idea that they were indeed being held 
in the thrall of Irish uh, inspired terror to convince juries that they had a crusade on their hands, that they had to drive out the Irish rabble. Americans everywhere were already frightened by the countrywide labor violence of the 1870s. And while the nation watched, the most sensational of that violence was being laid at the feet of the Irish. In court and in the newspapers, Gowan spun his tale of the Molly Maguires, a vicious secret society imported from Ireland to disrupt American industry, and fronted by the ancient order of Hibernians, the most prominent Irish fraternal organization in the nation. Throughout the trial, he consistently, as over 2,400 times, brought out the fact that a Molly Maguire was a member of the AOH, and AOH was a Molly Maguire, and if you're Irish, you're a member of the AOH, therefore you're a Molly Maguire. So he systematically spread a paintbrush here and smeared everybody who was Irish and Catholic. While defense attorneys argued specific cases, it was the AOH, the trade unionists, and the Catholic Church that took up the defense of the Irish and their institutions. Their defense was to put as much distance as they could between Irish America and anybody remotely connected with the Mollies. The Irish felt for their own salvation. They had to reject these wild men. They had to uh, say they're not part of our heritage. That's all there is to it. We just don't want to have anything to do with them and we'll not only have nothing to do with them, but we'll help you prosecute them. Nearly all the accused Mollies, some surely guilty of the crimes and some not, were convicted. I don't speak much English, a juror in Jack Keogh's trial reportedly said, but I'm for hanging. Twenty men were sentenced to die, including Keogh and Campbell. Without physical evidence or a single eyewitness linking him to the crime, Keogh was convicted of murdering a ticket boss 15 years earlier. The first execution, with Alec Campbell and nine others on the docket, was scheduled for June 21, 1877. Around the anthracite towns, they were calling it the Day of the Rope. The executions were, were uh, very much public spectacles. Between 250 and perhaps 300 people attended the principal executions at Pottsville in the form of deputies and witnesses and privileged observers. Uh, in other words, if you were rich and well-connected enough, you could come along and enjoy the, the show. The bodies as they swung on the ropes were not shielded from the public. They saw them die, saw them strangled and were allowed up on the scaffold afterwards to examine their faces, their bodies, after the execution. News of the first executions spread across a thankful nation, and Irish America itself had the most to be thankful for. The Molly Maguires had taken nobody else down with them, the bright future of the Irish in America remained intact. But in the mining patches, there was a frightened sense of regret. Father Daniel McDermott, who had been a strident critic of the Mollies, argued that the hanging should be discontinued, that enough men had died already. McDermott uh, is increasingly convinced that there is a miscarriage of justice going on here. And he publishes a piece in the New York Herald just after the executions saying that there is no effect without a cause, and that the cause of Molly Maguireism have been the brutal conditions faced by Irish mine workers. Another local priest led the fight to get Jack Keogh a stay of execution. But by then there was no way to bring the man dubbed the King of the Mollies back into respectable company. On December 18th, 1878, as his family watched, Jack Keogh was hanged. 